Okay, this is Federalist 26, Part 4. This is Paragraph 5. In that kingdom, when the pulse of liberty was at its highest pitch, no security against the danger of standing armies was thought requisite, beyond the prohibition of their being raised to kept up or kept up by the mere authority of the executive magistrate. The patriots who effected that memorable revolution were too temperate, too well informed to think of any restraints on the legislative discretion. Remember, he's still talking about the glorious revolution of 1688-1689. They were aware that a certain number of troops for guards and garrisons were indispensable, that no precise bounds could be set to the national exigencies, that a power equal to every possible contingency must exist somewhere in the government, and that when they referred the exercise of that power to the judgment of the legislature, they had arrived at the ultimate point of precaution, which was reconcilable with the safety of community. Remember, he's talking about the standing army and how it had to be under the control of the parliament, under the control of civilians. He says, in that revolutionary mood in England, this, this was what was going on. But he says, now, let's look. We get the idea of standing army from the English, because we, most of our people come from there. Most of our traditions are derived from there or associated with it. But he says, we are at a different point right now. We don't need to be scared of standing armies or a small professional force anymore. And he continues in the next paragraph, from the same source, the people of America may be said to have derived an herit hereditary, hereditary impression of the danger to liberty from standing armies in time of peace. The circumstances of a revolution quickened public sensibility on every point connected with the security of popular rights, and in some instances raised the warmth of our zeal beyond the degree which consisted with the due temperature of the body politic. The attempts of two of the states to restrict the authority of the legislature in the article of military establishments are of the number of these instances. So we had our revolution, and we see that two of our states, that's as we talked about, Pennsylvania and North Carolina, were stayed in too much of that revolutionary mood and said that we ought not to even think about standing armies in times of peace. So he said that revolutionary zeal stayed with only two of these states, two of our states. Even in some of the states where this error was not adopted, we find unnecessary declarations that the standing armies ought not to be kept up in time of peace without the consent of the legislature. I call them unnecessary because the reason which had introduced a similar provision in the English Bill of Rights is not applicable to any of the state constitutions. The power of raising armies at all under those constitutions can by no construction be deemed to reside anywhere else than in the legislatures themselves. And it was superfluous, if not absurd, to declare that a matter should not be done without the consent of a body which alone had the power of doing it. Accordingly, in some of those constitutions, 
and among others in that of the state of New York, which has been justly celebrated both in Europe and America as one of the best of the forms of government established in this country. There is a total silence upon that subject. He says some of our states went too far, even though they don't say anything about not having a standing army, but they come out and say that the standing army should be under the control of legislature. He says this is silly. We already know that the only reason that the British had to put that statement in their Bill of Rights in 1689 and say that the standing army had to be under the authority of Parliament is because up to then it had been under the authority of a king. So we wanted to make sure we get the king's hand off of it. But he says in our states, the legislatures run the show. And that's it's actually pretty soon in one of the Federalists, he's going to say that's one of the problems we have that the legislative branch is the most powerful branch in the state, and that is why we've had problems, and that's why we've written this new constitution. So he says, it's silly to even have to mention that. And again, he wants to say that our people, you have to be smarter than that. You cannot tie the hands of the national government down and expect it to get its job done. You cannot ask it not to have a small military and not worry about an invasion and the government not being able to do anything. So that's why he says you have to balance zeal of liberty with an enlightened view. You have to have the zeal. You have to have, yes, we want liberty, but at the same time, don't be blind to the fact that you have to have a government with enough authority to defend you. Okay, in the next paragraph, it is remarkable that even in two states which seem to have meditated an interdiction of military establishments in time of peace, the mode of expression made use of it is rather monitory than prohibitory. Okay? Remember the two states that we talked about, North Carolina and Pennsylvania? And let me finish the paragraph, and then I'll explain these two words. It is not said that standing armies shall not be kept up, but that they ought not to be kept up in time of peace. This ambiguity of terms appears to have been the result of a conflict between jealousy and conviction between the desire of excluding such establishment at all events and the persuasion that an absolute exclusion would be unwise and unsafe. So he says, even on those two states that say we shouldn't have standing armies, they have used a monetary phrase. Monetary is short for admonitory, admonition. They have advised that it should not be kept. They have not prohibited it. That's why he says they use the phrase ought not to be instead of shall not be. We talked about this before. That when you use shall not, like the First Amendment of the United States, it's totally prohibitory. It tells the Congress not to even think about this law says it's out of your hand, it's not your business. But he says these states issue a monetary statement that's admonitory, admonition, advice. So keep that in mind, it's very important. And then I'll read the next short paragraph. Can it be doubted that such a provision Whenever the situation of public affairs was understood to require a departure from it, would be interrupted, I'm sorry, would be interpreted by the legislature 
into a mere admonition and would be made to yield to the necessities or supposed necessities of the states, let the fact already mentioned with respect to Pennsylvania decide. What then, it may be asked, is the use of such a provision if it ceases to operate the moment there is an inclination to disregard it? Again, he reminds the readers that don't take an authority away from the government that you know in the time of emergency the government needs it. And then what the government has to do to keep you safe is to violate that same constitution because you have taken the power away from the government in the constitution. And like we talked about in the last Federalist, in Federalist 25, he says that is the worst thing to do because then you get the lawmakers used to breaking the law and that is the worst thing you can do. They just overstep their boundaries and before you know it, we have an authoritarian government and not a free government for free people. We'll continue in the next paragraph. Oh, well, uh, these are some of the other scholars that uh, I recommend you read their books. Gordon Lloyd is in charge of the Teaching American History website. Make sure you use that as a resource. And all these other authors I've mentioned to you before, if you can't read their books, make sure you watch their videos of their talks and lectures or panel discussions. You'll learn a lot about the American founding.